salute you all from Thessaloniki. I want to thank also the organizers for the kind invitation. Uh, of course, I'm afraid that uh, maybe I will, will bore you because we will move to an entirely different discipline. Actually, what I will be presenting is the um, impact of the emission reductions during lockdown on air quality. Of course, it's important to have good air that we breathe in our cities, but it, is, it has not directly any, any relation to COVID. Ho hopefully, you will be interested to hear what we are doing. Actually, we, our laboratory, and I should, of course, acknowledge the, the contribution of George Tsekas, whom you already mentioned. Our uh, laboratory is among those who are trying to establish valid urban scale source receptor relationships. By this, we understand the functional dependence of emissions and concentrations, which we are measuring. To do, in order to do this, we are using uh, our own uh, models, which we developed over the last decades. Actually, the line of development started when I was in Karlsruhe in the 80s. And these uh, models have been used for a number of um, uh, studies, um, of uh, international studies, actually, uh, some of them of which were uh, more or less of quite substantial political relevance. Um, when we first heard, not only us, but also all other colleagues in our uh, community uh, of the, uh, of the uh, lockdowns, we understood that this is a unique chance for our community. Uh, my friend and colleague uh, Paul Monks from Leicester spoke of the largest scale experiment ever in air pollution research, simply because we were expecting to see and to get uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting data from all over the world from a controlled um, uh, emission change, because almost everywhere we cut primarily traffic, but of course also other emissions. And so we would get all this information, which we desperately need in order to validate our models primarily. So this was a reason that we had an explosion of research also in our scientific uh, community. Uh, we had the, uh, the first paper uh, was accepted even before WHO declared the pandemic. And uh, of course, all of us started by trying to understand the observations. And um, gradually, most groups moved into the interpretation. And of course, some of them were, who are also using models tried to understand via the models the contributions of individual uh, polluters and also to what extent meteorology played a role in, in, in getting the concentrations with which we have been observing. To give you only one example here, uh, you see here the vertical column of nitrogen dioxide, um, which was produced here by the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. And you, we compare here for uh, NO2, the situation uh, during lockdown 2020 against the situation one year before. And of course, you can see that air became more clean. So we got better air, less concentration of NO2. So the uh, World Meteorological Organization, more specifically the Global Atmosphere Watch Program, uh, decided to, um, uh, to initiate a coordinated study on the impact of COVID-19 measures on air quality in cities. About 50 cities in uh, 30 countries uh, all over the uh, world uh, contribute, and they do exactly what I already mentioned, first understanding observations and then trying to use numerical modeling for the better interpretation. And it is evident that in order to uh, conduct such a simulation, we need also the emissions. And this is something that I will be telling you in one minute. Before I do that, uh, here you see the cities which uh, are uh, working in this co coordinated study. A good coverage, I would uh, uh, suggest, um, with the exception maybe of Africa. Uh, now to the lockdown periods, um, with the exception of um, Far East, in most of the situations we had uh, lockdown in springtime 2020, primarily between mid of March and uh, mid of uh, April, if, as we all remember. And uh, if I would uh, we be asked to show one uh, uh, summarizing uh, uh, slide for the, for the um, observations, I would show this one, because this shows how coherent the picture has been for nitrogen dioxide. We had almost everywhere uh, reductions of the order of 40%, I would say, simply because this is a, 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 a more or less a parameter which is depending primarily on road traffic. Uh, for the fine particulates, the picture is less coherent, I will say a few words in the next uh, transparencies because here you see the correlation 
the change in NO2 concentration as a function of the change in mobility. This is a quite strong positive correlation. In, on the contrary, for, P, for the finest particles, actually those who are emitted by the vehicles, you see that the correlation is mild because we do have here two things. Uh, first of all, a considerable amount of non-traffic sources, and of course, also meteorological effects, including also long-range transport in some of the cities. Uh, so uh, several groups and the numbers you see in the various uh, 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 pictures here are the groups contributing data uh, tried to account for meteorology. And if you do so, then you improve considerably the dependence of the percent change in several for several pollutants as um, functions of the stringency index from Oxford. Uh, the, so the, this is a very clear uh, picture for NO2, I would say, uh, taking into account meteorology. Uh, even for PM2.5, the finest particles, you get a considerable improvement. Uh, and this is the first um, uh, slide where you see also for uh, ozone as a, as a uh, more or less measure for photochemical pollution. I will explain in uh, two minutes, more or less, that so we get some uh, a slight increase of the photochemical pollution levels because, of course, of the uh, reduction of nitrogen oxides for those who are somehow knowledgeable in this field. So from the observations, we can already infer that there are other factors apart from emissions that uh, significantly affect concentrations so that uh, we do not uh, get the same signal on all locations. Uh, of course, there is a chance to differentiate uh, or, or between the, the characteristics of the monitoring stations to derive more information, but still we, we need for uh, the segregate in the contribution of different sectors uh, of models. And these models need to be fed by emission information and the Copernicus Consortium helped us considerably for the European Union at least, you see here the emission reductions as they have been provided by this consortium. Uh, on the top, you see the industrial emissions. The reductions here were uh, of the order of up to 20 to 30 percent. Uh, traffic, especially road transport and aviation shown here, were much uh, stronger reduced. Uh, aviation, we can remember that uh, practically no flights were, uh, no, no airplanes were flying in that time. In road transport, we had some variability in Europe with countries like France uh, going down by 90%, Sweden maybe 40%, Germany 50%. So all this information has to be known if we want really to um, uh, work appropriately with the models. Let me now um, uh, more or less address the question, what can be answered with models? Uh, primarily, of course, uh, the uh, uh, you can disaggregate and you see the uh, uh, role of the individual polluters, as I already said, for instance, specific fleet segments, also the role of non-transport emissions, uh, and then the uh, isolation of uh, non-emission effects, so that at the end of the day, you can answer the question on the net effect of emissions reduction on air quality. This cannot be done only on the basis of observations. And if you reach all this, then you can, can really then uh, increase the credibility of the models, as I initially said, so that, uh, for instance, you could uh, then uh, um, address questions like the wood legislation targeted emission reductions offer a real air quality benefit, which is very important for policy making, and also to what extent is legislation targeting the major pollution, pollution culprits, you remember all the diesel gates, let me only inform you that our laboratory is involved in the technical development of the Euro standards. Recently, we were uh, uh, somehow working on the Euro 7, as you know. Uh, and uh, of course, for this reason, we had a pronounced role uh, also in this um, part of the WMO study, uh, the modeling tasks, which we are leading. Uh, I don't want to read now all this uh, because the most is repetition of what I already said. Allow me to show you the cities contributing to this part of the study. Uh, this is roughly one third of the cities, um, unfortunately, primarily from Europe and the Americas. But OK, there are, of course, also one or two groups, one in Delhi and one in Melbourne, uh, out of these continents. Uh, and uh, now I jump uh, to some uh, indicative results. I start with our own uh, work. 
who are working with uh, um, non-hydrostatic mesoscale model for providing the meteorological fields and a chemical uh, transport model to, uh, to, uh, to deal with the dispersion and uh, photochemical transformation, including also the secondary aerosols. Um, let me uh, only, uh, inform you that our major interest lies in the multi-scale characteristics of the dispersion in the atmosphere and also on the need to have a best possible synergy between data and models. We are, are not only needing the data in order to validate the models, but we are doing together with other colleagues, of course, we are applying methods like the data assimilation where data can help us uh, improve the performance of the models. And uh, let me also inform you that this system that we are uh, using is the official system providing uh, the um, air quality management uh, the system for the uh, large Thessaloniki area, which is the region of central Macedonia, and the whole of the Republic of uh, Cyprus, including the northern part, by the way. So let's uh, go back to Thessaloniki. You saw a picture in the very beginning. It is uh, the second largest Greek city, which uh, is about one million inhabitants uh, together with the suburbs. Uh, we did um, face considerable air, air pollution problems uh, in the past. Uh, the crisis helped because thanks to the crisis, we had not so much uh, use of cars and therefore less, less emissions and a better air quality. On the other hand, we got biomass burning during this time because people were not rich enough to pay the high, high, high prices for the for the normal uh, fuels for he heating their houses. So these biomass consider brought considerable problems to our air quality. Now I return to the lockdown. The comes uh, estimates for the Saloniki are shown again on this transparency. You can see that we did have primarily reductions of the transport and aviation. Um, emissions, uh, uh, you see here the, actually the activity reductions, you get the emission reductions if you uh, use the activity reductions and multiply them with the appropriate emission factors. Uh, for NOx, the total uh, nitrogen oxide emissions, you get this picture um, and um, we had actually a rather cool spring time in the 2020, therefore also some heating which you see here. So these bars uh, show the development of the emissions. Uh, it is exactly the blue curve which you see here, superimposed also with our model results. And it is uh, why, what one would expect that we do have uh, concentrations which is in some periods are higher uh, compared to the emissions because of the wind speed. And at the bottom of this uh, slide, you see the average winds for each day. So uh, low wind means higher concentration, high wind speed because of the better ventilation leads to lower concentrations. The hard test, of course, is here the comparison against the measurements. And this uh, led to a quite satisfactory correlation coefficient of 0.73. And uh, using, of course, this model, one can now uh, uh, compare against the baseline, so without the uh, reductions during lockdown, and this leads to the uh, confirmation of the difference of 40%, which was also true for Thessaloniki. And uh, to ozone, no time to explain all this. Hopefully, most of you know that uh, we have here the formation of uh, photochemical oxidants. Ozone is the major representative. And if you reduce the level of NOx, you also have loss uh, much less loss of ozone by titration. And for this reason, one should expect the slight increase I spoke about. And our model provides exactly this, this increase uh, in uh, a good comparison with what has been measured in this area uh, close to the Thessaloniki, this is a suburb actually, because downtown you, you never measure sub, um, quantities of ozone. You have even, uh, as I said, the loss because of titration and therefore their ozone is actually rather low. Now uh, I will uh, uh, close with three uh, uh, slides of uh, other colleagues. My uh, good friend Ranjit Soki, who is actually the chair of this uh, the Global Atmosphere Watch program, uh, for, uh, for this activity here, provided a number of uh, results for uh, UK cities. Again, uh, similar to what I showed for Thessaloniki, substantial reduce reductions of NOx, uh, in, in, in particular NO2, and less uh, decrease for PM10 and PM2.5. 
and also slight increases of, uh, of ozone. Um, may, maybe more interesting for you, Berlin, uh, my good co colleague Tim Butler in Potsdam provides here these uh, results for the moment. We had uh, a reduction of the emissions by about 33%. This is ob ob about also his result for the roughly the same uh, reduction for the NO2 concentrations. He thinks that he still overestimates ozone, so his ozone increases a little higher, and he's just about now to find out whether this is really true for Berlin for that period, or if it's still something to change in the model. And the last example out of the 17 groups that contributing result, are contributing results from Canada, our friends from Environment and Climate Change Canada, who provided information for the four conurbations in their country. Again, same figures as I said, as showed for Europe. And you can imagine, dear colleagues, that of course for us now it's very interesting and nice that we have this information from Canada and we could apply our models for Canadian cities and the Canadians can use the information we got in Europe. So in the next years, we will have quite a drastic interaction with among our, these 17 groups in order to uh, improve our culture our, uh, regarding the validation. So let me conclude. Uh, large reductions in urban NO2 concentrations and corresponding ozone increases point to an important impact of road traffic reductions in urban centers. Uh, PM was less affected. Uh, only measurements, I hope that I was uh, in a position to convince you, are insufficient for quantifying the significant influences of other emission sectors and also the weather variability. Um, so the models are a powerful tool in disaggregating the effects of the aforementioned factors. At the moment, most of the groups working for this uh, uh, activity of uh, uh, the World Meteorological Organization are trying to include novel approaches in the models in order to widen the modeling capabilities. And last but not least, we are very optimistic that the largest scale experiment ever in air pollution research will result in a significant improvement of our validation practices so that our models will be really very credible in future in order to answer questions that policymakers are asking so that the com our community will be provide a real help to them to get also the appropriate decisions for interventions to our emissions in our cities. Thank you very much for your attention. Of course, I'm prepared to answer any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I, are there any questions from the audience? So I probably start with a very naive question. Uh, we know that air quality decreases lifespan uh, substantially in big cities at least. Um, did uh, the lockdown in worldwide, the global lockdown contribute to let's say, an increase in life expectancy, or is this just too little contribution to be valid or visible? Your question is not naive at all. Uh, we, of course, <laughs> we are involved in, uh, in, in, in such uh, work with air quality and health, and there are colleagues who are um, absolute experts. And in the first year, when, where in most countries, the number of the, uh, de the deaths were not that numerous uh, compared to the second year, uh, we really were able, able to claim that there is a, uh, let's say, a counter, counterbalancing from the better air quality, which we uh, got 2020 through the, through the lockdown, so that we had le less lo losses of human lives. Uh, but of course, we cannot uh, quantify this at the moment because we did only have some estimates for a number of cities. And uh, therefore, I can expect that in the next years, we might have a more complete picture to show uh, what would, could be the consequence of the improvements in 2020. Uh, in 2021, by the way, we didn't have so such a coherent picture. And therefore, it is uh, most of our work fo focuses on the first year of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, one more question from Andreas Rathburg. Yeah, I was wondering whether you can be a bit more precise which of the lockdown measures uh, really uh, had most impact. Uh, let's say, for example, some uh, measures that can be hold up on the long run, like home office versus logistics travel, which probably cannot be uh, stopped um, on the long run. So is there any more detailed uh, comparing different types of lockdowns, so any more detailed information? The answer is here that the road traffic 
was actually the polluter which uh, proved to be the most uh, significant. And uh, you can now, of course, start thinking, how can you um, keep the, the levels of, uh, of uh, traffic jumps in the cities and uh, uh, also the use of the car uh, as low as possible? I mean, home office, of course, helps, but uh, not, not, not only home office. I believe the logistics solutions that uh, we developed during this period uh, could uh, be quantified to some extent. And I can imagine that uh, having these tools that we are about now trying to validate in a better way, if they are really proved to be credible, then policymakers, especially local policy makers for in the, the mayors and so on, would then have a chance to uh, do the, uh, good, a good job for the citizens.